Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ikus Unscripted podcast powered by Jägermeister. We are joined by remarkable and distinguished talent. He is the man behind your favorite voices, the embodiment of countless beloved characters that have warmed our hearts and fired our imaginations from portraying heroes to villains, wizards to warriors. His vocal artistry has left an undeniable mark on pop culture, transcending the boundaries of the screen to become a true icon in the realm of animation. Get ready to dive deep into mesmerizing world of voice acting as we are thrilled to welcome the incredibly talented and versatile Jason Spizek to the show. And I hope Jason is ready to go genuine uncensored and unscripted with us today. I, I am ready. If I feel like that is consent. So yes, <laughs> I, I consent to this podcast. Yeah, it's important to be consensual. <laughs> With that introduction, I just felt like I don't know who you were talking about. I felt I felt quite quite boosted, as they say. You you've buffed me quite well before I I get to be on the podcast. So well, I achieved my goal then. Yes, you did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen. In our lifetime, more or less, anyone can be an artist, and in and this episode is a little bit more personal to me because when I was a kid, my one of my dreams was to be a voice actor, uh, and me too. I, yeah, but uh, somewhere down the line, I went the other way. Also, I tried to be the dinosaur tamer, but that di- didn't play out for obvious reasons, well, of course. But <laughs> yeah, there's still genetic modification. We might get there. You never. Yeah, so. yeah, just just few lifetimes. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. But you know, I, I was your daily impersonator. We would gather on the play playground after the game of football, and I would be a star of the night, and I fucking liked it. <laughs> but nice. Anyways, anyways, uh, even if anyone can be an artist it is necessary for them to hone their skill and how do you hone your ability to come up with unique voices regularly well i've i've been doing this for gosh i think 28 years now so it's a combination of experience doing something for that long you know anytime i think the saying goes if you do something 10,000 times you're an expert right okay. so repetition more than anything else that you get an audition in and you have to turn it around and you have less than, you know, 24 hours. So it's not like you have, you get to sit there and, and ruminate over uh, other thousand choices that could become this character. You simply have to learn to trust your instincts and commit. And that is me. Yeah. No, go on, go. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say that to me is what acting is all about. So it's not, it's, it's about making decisions based on what the writer gives you, based on what the artists give you, based on what, you know, the universe that the story takes place in gives you and using your intuition to make a strong decision and commit to it. Right. And, and I think I've done a lot of character work, you know, some people, uh, you hear their voice and they get selected because they're just kind of being themselves in a way. And that really never happened a lot for me. <laughs> I, I tended to be able to create very distinct characters that still resonated in a real way. And I think, and everybody's career is different, but at least from my standpoint, it came from, I wanted to make a very strong choice that was grounded in the universe that I'm trying to tell the story in and commit to it, you know? Uh, and I think that's where, that's where I, I get most of my headway accomplished rather quickly is my imagination. I don't judge it. I don't say this, you know, I don't rule anything out and I just let it flow and dial it in, dial it in, dial it in, dial it in, and then it, and then it lands. So, yeah, there, I mean, if that, if that, if that answers your question, it's really a, a imagination driven process, for me. Mm-hmm. not tech. But, but, okay. But do you get lost sometimes in all that repetition or maybe do you even sometimes have it happen to you to struggle on set or offset in the studio? 
to make voice that you usually do, or even maybe to forget the way how you made certain uh, voices? Really, it doesn't happen to me. And I think the reason why is because I see every story as unique. So there's, there's two problems that you just addressed. The first one is, how do you deal with a voice that you have made before and you are coming back to? Well, that is pretty easy because you've already made the voice. You already know what it sounds like. You've already been in the universe and all they have to do is play it back to you. You know what they call a playback and you can get in the spirit pretty quickly. Um, but as far as creating new voices when you, you don't really have anything to go off of, it's just your imagination. The writers have done an incredible job. I mean, the writers in, in America, you know, uh, are on strike right now because they, nothing happens without them. They're, it's like the very foundation of your house. Nothing, you can't build on it without a strong foundation. And the writers are incredibly gifted storytellers and they lay the foundation on which everything else is built. So when I get a script, no two scripts are the same. No two characters are the same. No two stories are the same. They may have similarities and, and archetypes and things, but truly, if you read the material, if you honor the writer's hard work, if you, you know, really respect the universe that you're trying to tell this story in, differences automatically reveal themselves. Unique things come to light uh, if you if you simply look. You know? Oh yeah. Yeah, but to be a voice actor is more than just to uh, read the script, you know. How important for you is to get to know the character, to develop his personality and, I mean, genuinely act uh, in such way. Is acting crucial to bring out the emotion and depth of the character? It is. And character work um, is, to me, separate from storytelling in a way. Because... You have to you have to build a character that is believable in the world that you're you're trying to tell the story in. So, for example, Silco is very different than Wally West, right? the The world of Young Justice is different than the world of Arcane, and the type of voice that you're going to do and bring to those is different styles of animation. It's different styles of storytelling, um, different worlds with different levels of consequences. So. The character you build has to fit. It's like a set of clothing, right? It's like wearing the correct outfit for the occasion. That's the character. And I would say that has a lot less to do with acting and a lot more with understanding the story that was written. Now, acting, obviously I went to a conservatory theater and I have spent you know many years training prior to ever getting to Los Angeles working on my craft voiceover wise you have to learn to be a good actor in order to be a good voice actor voice acting and acting are identical they're the same thing it's just sort of like a name for a subset you know and when you are portraying a character you're committing to a set of circumstances you have to act as though the circumstances are real and you have to act believably in that made up set of circumstances. So, and the only way I can think to, to tell people about this is when you were a child, you had no trouble at all imagining that what you had in your hand was a gun or a, a magic wand and what you, you were, you were a wizard or you were a soldier or you were a fireman. You had no trouble committing 100% when you were a child to pretend to play. And it was real to you and it was real to all of your friends. And you made things up in your brain that were all of the circumstances that were going along with the game. Well, being an actor is just like remembering how to be a child in that moment and be just as committed and being just as affected when something happens to you and being just as impacted when your friend is laying on the ground you know, bleeding out, even though they're not bleeding out as a kid, you know, you were, you were fired up about that. So really to me, real acting is committing to a set of circumstances as if they were real. And the only way you can do that is to use your imagination and the gift that you had as a child was to just suspend your reality and replace it with another one. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, now that you mention uh, also that uh, voice acting and uh, acting are, you know, obviously uh, have a lot of going for uh, for each other and uh, they're kind of the same thing. I think uh, general audience sometimes, uh, you know, in, in press, even in live action films, I think we forget as uh, audience members how much the voice is actually impactful for the performance. I remember Daniel Day-Lewis uh-huh. said uh, once that uh, the voices of his character are kind of a fingerprints of their soul. Do you, do you f- kind of uh, coincide with that philosophy? I, I completely agree with Daniel Day-Lewis. <laughs> As an actor, you can't, you can't go wrong if you say that you agree with him. So, I, yes, I do think the voice is the fingerprint of the, of the characters that I create. I mean, for example, like Ukon in Gears of War Tactics, right? You know, if you look at the characters, visually, they have created this snake-like, seven-foot-tall lizard creature with fangs and, you know, it. You, you imagine the type of voice that would come out of him, but until you actually hear, you know, these ghost arrogant little gears, their own instructors. Until you actually hear what it sounds like to have a mouth full of teeth, what it sounds like to have a voice that's been racked by, you know, horrible science mistakes and everything, you know, and it it doesn't exist. It's just a picture. And so I I I do concur with Daniel Day Lewis and the fact that, you know, the voice of something is how its soul speaks, I think is, would be the way that I, I would put it. Yeah. Okay. And it's, it's also interesting that you mentioned, uh, that interpretation because for example, I'm a huge anime fan. Uh, and when you read the, the mangas and obviously characters don't have the voice, but, uh, right. long before they will ever be adapted into anime fans online will speculate about who is the right voice for this guy. Or this character, Correct. because we in our heads create this is something right. that fits this one. Right. When you read a, a manga, you you are actually you're hearing a voice when the character speaks, and it's almost like you can't you can't not do that. You can't mm-hmm. not read and hear a voice when the the character is speaking. So it, it's it's sort of like soulless until it gets the voice, and sometimes that's just in your head because it hasn't been performed yet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and especially if that's if that's the manga that already has anime, and you, you can't yeah. read One Piece now not to hear Luffy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you, and yeah, it's impossible to separate the two, right? You can't replace oh, yeah. a character's soul with a different soul. Mm-hmm. Well, once you hear it, yeah. And uh, Peter Cullen, one of the all-time greats, talked about the inspiration beha- behind his voices like uh, legendary Optimus Prime voice and how he came up yeah. with Predator sound and Optimus voice in particular was inspired by his brother. And have you, uh, you, you yourself have maybe some life event impacted roles you voiced? Imagine you're driving to the studio, you have one voice in your head, you're exercising on your way there, but just out of nowhere, somewhere, uh, something new comes and you come with yeah. something completely different in the final portrayal. That happened in Young Justice. Um, there's a character that I play called Forager. Oh, and yes. Forager is like a yeah. bug character. Mm-hmm. And you are now part of Forager's hive. Like, mm-hmm. he has this very bug-like voice. Mm-hmm. And I was in the car listening to, like, a, a documentary audio segment on cicadas, which are the, you know, bugs that we have in the, the trees here. I don't know if they have them in other regions of the world. But cicadas... At night, in a certain season, you can hear just this cacophony, this wall of bug sound. And in the documentary, they were actually separating the sounds that the bugs make. Um, and they, they played each one of them in the documentary. They said, okay, this wall of bug noise is actually made of these three separate sounds. There's this, there's this, and there's this. And those three sounds, all the different bugs are making them at different times. And so it sounds like this wall of noise. And when I heard those separate noises and I thought, well, 
forager is a bug from another planet where it, you know, basically the inhabitants of that planet, indigenous species were bugs. Maybe they speak universal bug. So when Forager in the show, if you watch Young Justice, um, his Forager's in a few seasons, uh, more recent ones, you will hear him make these clicking noises. And it was just me saying, when he speaks English, sometimes he ends up speaking a little bug at the end of a sentence, you know, like we have accents, you know, our, you know, your English is accented and whatever. And yeah. it's like, so he would say, you know, the forager is forager. Fine. And he'd make these noises. And so I would just, I would just practice taking those sounds and, and putting them in order and uh, bringing that to the performance. That's cool. So that you feel like he's a bug from another planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Forager. Just got a lot more interesting to me than uh, Kid Flash. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, did, I didn't have any documentaries for Wally. Wally, <laughs> just a, a lovable douche who is. You know, I love my. I love Wally West so much. So. Yeah, great. Cut. Hey, inches above sizzling death. I'm entitled to speak my mind. <laughs> Wally, wow, that's yes. a skill. Yeah, it, it's unique and distinctive vocal style. And him yep. being a teenager and you being in your forties, how did you find the right horse <laughs> for, for him? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, at the time, I was a little younger. Cough, cough. Uh, you know. Yeah. I, you think I, was, I think I was thirty-five when I did Wally, or thirty. The first Wally, yeah. Yeah, the very first yeah. time I ever. I thought about it. Young Justice, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, no, Young Justice. Even, even the first episode of Young Justice, I think, was ten years ago. Uh, yeah, it's a long time ago. Yeah, I think Fuck, I, I am old. Maybe my, me too. I think <laughs> I was, I think I was, maybe I was 37 or 38. I'd have to look up when it was. Um, but I, I have, I just, when you read the scripts for Young Justice and when you see the picture of who Wally is, to me, it's just obvious the voice that comes out of this person. You know, it has to have that rapid fire energy and that sort of lovable dopiness, you know, in a way, you know, don't worry, Megalicious, I got you. Like, it just has to have this brightness to it, this energy, this positive crackling energy that like, you know, he's from the speed force, you know, in a way it is, it, it his voice has to have that sort of speed, that positive uh, energy behind it. And uh, yeah, like it, to me, that stuff is just, intuition it's mm -hmm. it has to map onto it and, uh, i connected with wally right away <laughs> yeah yeah but you played uh, a lot of characters in young justice in particular like forager like kid flash was it tough to juggle between all those roles not really i mean only because i never played forager and kid flash on the same season mm -hmm. but forager has a human voice so Forager, when they put the glamour charm around his neck, he becomes a human. He no longer looks like a bug, and it hides his extra arms. And I talked to Greg and Brandon about that moment because the glamour charm changes how other people perceive that character in the world. And I said, wouldn't it make sense that Forager's voice was altered? Because when Artemis put on the glamour charm, charm they altered artemis's voice a little bit made it a little deeper a little raspier and i said well it would make sense for forager's human voice to sound similar to his bug voice in the underlying characteristics so forager is an outsider his voice is a little different he speaks a little differently so if you were to translate that into what a young human boy would sound like, and you get this voice where it's like, hi, I'm Fred Bug with two Gs, and like his vocal cords don't quite come all the way together, it would be as if he would have to be awkward in high school. He would sound different than the other kids. Kids might make, make, make fun of him. And these are all the things that happened to Forager on his home planet, right? He was an out, outside for, even on his home planet. So I just kind of took Forager's characteristics and moved them from bug to human when I played Fred Bug. I am Fred Bug with two Gs. And, you know, I just kind of came up with 
uh, his human voice. Yeah, you made him an MVP <laughs> of Young Dust. <laughs> yeah, with 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 the same underlying characteristics, but he's a human instead of a bug. So, yeah, and and I had to bounce back and forth between the two, you know. So you would get Forager. You are now part of Forager's hive, and then I'd have to be a Fred Bug with UGs after he put the glamour charm on in the same suit. Oh yeah, that's that's right. And you you yeah. you bounce. I I did have to bounce between them, and and look, it's just it's a level of talent and it's a level of experience and vocal flexibility and you practice it a little bit so you have the voice and then you just off to the races yeah. well let me ask you this maybe have you maybe experienced that you are stuck with the character with the voice of the character you played because for example austin butler said he got stuck with Elvis Presley's voice after the movie well you mean that other people only hear you like that you mean typecast yeah i mean or you told mean that that my voice just stays there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no. are you talking no. like Silco? It's disturbing if you call your Was I kids with Silco like voice. <laughs> Real power doesn't come to those that were born shot still smart, still strongest. No. It comes to those that will do anything to achieve it. You know, I, I, I don't, I never, <laughs> I never get stuck um, in a voice. It doesn't happen. I, I don't know. It might happen to people, but to me, they are a performance. They are a character who lives and exists in a specific world. And so, no, they don't. They stay with me, meaning they're always there for me to call them up, but they they don't inhabit my daily life. Yeah. I, I, I don't. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, sometimes I'll say something or I'll feel like a moment in life is just crying out for it to be said as Zilko or Wally <laughs> yeah. or somebody like, you know, yeah. you know, but Who they, they don't, not? they don't get stuck. Right. You know, <laughs> you're like, you need an advice from the character. <laughs> right, right, right. So it's, it's all great right. until you start talking in the mirror right. with Zilko. <laughs> your, your friend is like having a really bad day and it's like, don't cry. <laughs> <laughs> but it also freaks people out. You know, then they're having a depressed day and they're like having a psychotic episode. So you, <laughs> you have to be careful. You know? oh, yeah, yeah you, would, you, you wouldn't want to go into bakery with Silco. <laughs> right. That would be very bad. You'd have, you'd there'd be baked goods all over the floor. Give me those croissants now. <laughs> I don't want <laughs> Let me call police first. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. The enforcers would go up. Yeah, pretty yeah. quick. And yeah. how did you find the right voice for Silco? Well, uh, they, first of all, the writing for that show is incredible. I keep yeah. saying that it's the writer's fault that I have good voices, but really you have to look at the words that are being said. And the audition for Silco was the monologue from the beginning of episode three. Do you ever wonder what it's like to draw? Wow. And it, it's, you can't read that monologue and not feel this incredible smoky sense of manipulation. And that was one of the things that, that the brilliant creators of Arcade, Christian and Alex, they, uh, Christian Link and Alex Yee, they came up with this incredible story and they had talked to me about the voice of Silco being smoke. It's almost like it envelops you and manipulates you into doing what it is that he wants. And, but I, they didn't get to talk to me before the very first audition I ever did. And I pretty much had that same voice from the very beginning. And they said that when they heard it, they went, this is it, this is the guy. And I, I, I just read that monologue uh, and it, I couldn't hear any other voice. It was almost like, I don't know, the, the meant to be in a way. I just, I just did the monologue in that voice, and it couldn't hear it any other way. Is there a particular scene in Arcane where you felt especially connected to Silco and his emotions? You know, to this complicated character. Yeah, I mean, several actually, and he evolves over the course of the story. I think that's why people love the character so much. Is he's not the same man before powder runs up to him and hugs him mm -hmm. in the alley 
And he's not the same man at the end when, you know, he's talking to Jinx, you know, in the very last scene. He's, he's, he goes on this, this journey. To me, the monologue from the beginning of Act 3, I would always practice it when they were doing the sound check. So in the beginning, you know, when you get to a studio and they're starting recording for the day, with your character, they have to balance the levels so that they match the previous recordings so that they can hear you properly on the microphone. And that's called a sound check. And when they would do sound checks for Arcane, I would always do the entire monologue from memory. Uh, to set the character for me and to set everyone in the room into the space that Arcane takes place, the vocal director, everybody, I wanted to just kind of bring everyone everyone into that space me included because whatever you're doing outside that room is not arcane and whatever you're doing inside those moments that is arcane and it helped us it helped me it helped everybody i think just to kind of get us back to that place and uh yeah uh, so that monologue where he talks about do you ever wonder what it's like to drown it's the story of opposites there's peace in water like it's hope whispering in low tones to let it in and every problem in the world fading away but then there's this thing in your head and it's raging lighting every nerve with madness to fight to survive and all the while one question lingers before you have you had enough it's funny please more <laughs> oh yeah i can just keep going <laughs> I mean, like, like it, 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 I started to sweat. If you listen to that monologue, it defines Silco as a person mm -hmm. because it is the betrayal that started him on this journey to who he is today. It is what brotherhood was to him and how it was shattered. It is the way that Piltover treats Zong. It, it is, it encapsulates so much of who he is as a person. And that's why. I think it's central to his character. And I love to do that. To and of course, the lines, you know, at the end, I never would have given you to them. Not for anything. Don't cry. You're perfect. That line, if you think about what he says, he's telling the audience as well as Jinx that never doubt that you were my daughter. Never yeah. doubt that even though I would put one face on for Piltover, I'm manipulating them. Never doubt that to me, truly, you were my daughter and I loved you. I would never have given you to them. Because there's some people who are like, Silco's manipulative. He, he didn't care about Jinx, you know, blah, blah, blah. And they're all full of it. Jinx was everything to Silco. The embodiment of who the nation of Zon can be. No longer in the shadow of Piltover. Using their ingenuity and, and power to stake their own claim as a people. And that's, uh, Jinx is the embodiment of that. That's why he says Jinx is perfect. That you could never go back to being powder and everything because it, it, they rejected that. You know, Vi rejected that. And Vi felt awful about doing so, but she did, right? You know, and people ask, you know, would Vander have accepted Jinx for who, who they are? And I'm not sure he would but Silco does. So again, it's a lot of complicated questions wrapped up in that. And Silco trying to be the best father that he could because he never had one. And that's what fatherhood is. You just try your best to be a father with what you've been given. And you fall short of the ideal. Silco's not a perfect man by any stretch. He's a sociopath. I wouldn't want him as a father. But look, in the circumstance, he, in his dying breath, validated his daughter. And there are so many daughters who don't get validated at all. So, you know, it's a tough question. And uh, it, I think that's that's who Silco is. At least that's what his journey shared with me. Yeah, and that's why it is a big animated spectacle. And not just animated, any medium. It's yeah. just, you know, something special. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the arcane, you know, it's very Yeah, there's nothing like it at all and it's it stands alone on its on an island of animated excellence the, the 
talented, talented people at Fortiche. They just rewrote the book on what it was like to watch an animation project. Oh, yeah. and the music and storytelling, the writing and the acting, it just set a bar that is going to be difficult to meet for the rest of existence. We'll see what happens. Yeah, it, it's hard. It's so hard to pick a highlight of the show. Is it writing? Oh, yeah. Is it acting? Is it animation? Music? Yeah. 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 And, and it and also... So... Yeah, go ahead. No, I just think that that's one of the things that makes it rare. Because many shows, you can pick what the highlight is. Yeah. You know, and everybody brought their best game. Um, and it was a privilege to be a part of it. I count myself lucky as an actor. You hope to be able to stumble with your talent and your hard work into something that is wonderful as arcane. And I thank Christian and Alex every day that they chose me to be a part of it because I felt like, you know, it, it could have been anyone. And I was glad that they picked me. So. Uh, or you should be, damn you, uh, Alex and Christopher, for making me fun favorite. Damn you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Our, oh, yeah. Damn you for the way that season one ended is what I think. <laughs> Can we kind of see you in a season two? <laughs> yeah. Well, I've recorded lines for season two. They let me say it. They, they, oh. the Riot Games let me tell people. They said, you can officially tell people that you have recorded lines for season two. So I'm allowed to say that I have. Fuck yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'll be, I'll be Forager in season two. <laughs> <laughs> it's multiverse, I mean. Yeah, exactly. There are no rules but one. Drink Jägermeister at minus 18 degrees Celsius. We are back at staggering 40 degrees Celsius in here. <laughs> oh man, I am not envious of you, my friends. <laughs> you should be. Global. It's, it's awesome. <laughs> Global warming has you in, in its clutches. Like. Oh, yeah. But we got air conditioning now. Uh, <laughs> Hey, that's Finally, awesome. somebody remember to turn it on. Yes. We just need to make an air conditioner the size of the planet, I guess. We'll be a pie. We'll be fun. Easy task. Easy task. Fun. <laughs> Obviously, now we talked about uh, the, uh, the Arcane, the, the, the Wally West, and, uh, you know, many of these characters that you also gave voice to, like, for example, Penguin in the uh, Batman game, uh, they had previous incar incarnations, right? Uh, Correct. My one, yeah, my favorite. Yeah, Batman Hush. Ooh. Yeah, oh yeah. And uh, one of my favorite portrayals is actually Danny DeVito's Penguin. Uh, do Do you look at those performances uh, before or or to to you know? No, maybe not yet. No, I mean I've seen I've seen Danny DeVito's uh, uh, portrayal of the Penguin. I've you know, and I've gotten a chance to you know take in a lot of entertainment media. You know, just as an actor, you you know you you go see movies, you watch TV, you you know, and but when I'm building a character, I just, I close the door to every other performance I've seen and I read the script that's in front of me and I talk to the director and everybody, I want to see what the world is like that they're creating. Because Danny DeVito's Penguin wouldn't fit in Telltale Games' Batman. Oh, no, no, no. Right? And, and neither would a lot of portrayals of the Penguin, you know? Um, and Oz, as he's known in that game, he... It's a completely different telling of how Penguin came to know Bruce Wayne and whether or not, you know, they knew each other in childhood. And he's this sort of slick Londoner a bit. And uh, he plays, you know, two roles, uh, you know. It, it, he is unique to that universe. The portrayal of the Penguin that I created, you know. Oh, Bruce, this is why we can't have nice things. You know, he, 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 he plays the CEO, but then he's also, you know, fire the moderator. You know, he's also, you know, got the mask on and he's going nuts. So, you know, it's to me, you, I couldn't have seen him a, as someone else's penguin. He, he always had to be this sort of handsome version. It, it almost, almost, almost likable in a hateable way. Right, sort of the he almost has gives Bruce Wayne a run for his money in the handsome department. As strange as that sounds, but in a in a sort of you know ruffian kind of way, 
And I think that adds to the penguin's power in that story, right? He's not this sort of ugly stepchild forgotten thing. You know, it's it's a really fascinating telling of 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 Oswald that he could have in another life been Bruce Wayne. Yeah, and pretty cool. Also, also in like uh, Danny DeVito has like a lot of performance. He has a lot of Tim Burton universe around it. Of course, yeah. it does. Yeah, it does. You know, and I would say it's a cartoon brought to life. You know, Tim Burton stuff. Yeah, a lot of times. You know, and Telltale Games is, you know, they tried to be very realistic, even though the animation and game style was more simplistic. They always wanted the performances to be more grounded, like you were reading a comic book. So it was kind of like the inverse, right? That 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 Tim's is real people acting like cartoons, and Telltale Games is cartoons wanting to sound like real people. You're playing what is Rangers? characters from Silk or Kid Flash, but not just that. You are playing orcs in uh, Shadow of the, of the Middle Earth. Yeah. And yeah. in some way, you are limitless, boundless. But you hear them live-action actors. You are able to yes. do everything you imagine to be. Is that humble? Oh, yeah. Uh, I love not, not being live-action. I mean, I'm going to be <laughs> in a horror Western film here, you know, coming up this year, and I've played some done some live-action. But, you know, in a sense, some of live-action is just limited by what you bring as yourself and sure. voice acting has zero limits. And I love that. It, 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 it allows me to explore the full range of what my imagination is capable of. And acting is, is imagination. So to have no limits on it is an incredible privilege. Yeah. Mm. Oh, this, they are just no deliciously awful, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Did you, can, could you do a little bit of Olive Under since I'm a Big Harry Potter fan. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, Harry Potter uh, Magic um, uh, Awakens. It just came out. I think yeah. that's, that's what it's called. Um, and I got the honor, because John Hurd is no longer with us, to play Ollivander um, in that game. And I've always loved doing the voices from Harry Potter. And uh, So, um, curious. Very curious. It's curious that you should be destined for this one when its brother gave you that star. Though we do not speak his name, but it's clear we can expect great things from you. After all, he who must not be named is great. Well, it's terrible, but okay. uh, that's <laughs> not bad. Yes. I would like to know about one, three quarters, Applewood, hmm, Dragon Heart. Like, he, it, it's great because uh, since it already existed as a voice print, I, I, it was all I had to do was honor the original performance and getting to say new words as Ollivander is such a, just a treat. No, no, definitely not. Yeah. So it's <laughs> lots of. It's awesome. I would like to have you when I read the book next time when I open the first one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can also do this your voice. Cat. I, I can do a bunch of good voices from that, that show, yeah. Difficult. Very difficult. Plenty of courage. Yeah. And not a bad mind either. But where to put you? You. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Slithering. Yeah. Uh... Not Slithering, eh? That'd be great, you know. And Slytherin could help you on the path to great. There's no doubt about that. Yeah. That'd be... Well, I always like... <laughs> well, they had the the, the, the best uh, the best place to live in Gryffindor. You know, the they sure Gryffindor. did. I, I did love the, the Harry Potter um, Hogwarts Legacy. I did love that game. It was quite something. I got to play it with a dear friend of mine. and You know... It was uh, lots of fun. You, did you also do some motion capture? Yes, I've done lots of motion capture. I've, I've played Dante in Uncharted, Golden Abyss. I've played Schizo in Days Gone. Um, I've played um, uh, this beautiful hunchback character called Chum Bucket in Mad Max, the video game. But the video game, I, Mad Max, right? 
Yeah. I've played a lot of characters in motion capture. So yeah, I love to do it. Yeah, and, and how how different is it from acting? Voice acting. Well, I mean it is. It is voice acting, but it's it has the movement of stage, the voice acting of cinema, um, the facial expressions of cinema, um, and the imagination of a black box theater like of childhood because you don't actually have a costume on you. But you like I played Uka in, in Gears of War Tactics, I did both the voice and the body movement. So whenever you see Ukon in that giant robe, that's me. I'm <laughs> acting like a seven foot tall lizard creature in a robe. With mouth full of teeth. <laughs> With mouth full of teeth, yeah. I mean the the physicality of him is very slow and kind of lumbering and he's got this this long flowy outfit on that I had to honor. He couldn't put his arms in certain ways, you know. And it really challenges the rest of my imagination. That's one of the things I love about motion capture. I would do motion capture every day if I could. It's so much fun. It's like being a kid again. Literally, you put on this suit and you pretend about what you're wearing. You pretend about the gun you're holding. You pretend about the stairs you're walking up or just a bunch of boxes. And they're showing it to you on a screen what it might look like in a light 3D rendering. And you have to just replace the rest of it with your imagination. And it's, again, the body movements of stage, like you do in the theater, but the voice and the face of cinema, it, it's it's quite a combination. And not everybody can do it. They wear the suit and they get their brain just, sometimes they freeze up or they just do it like they're on set of a movie and then nothing, re nothing reads because they're not doing anything with their bodies. So yeah, it takes a special set of talents and uh, I seem to be uniquely suited to it. And I look at it. <laughs> yeah. We we mentioned motion uh, capture also when we had Chris Brewster a few weeks ago here. Yeah, and I think world is taking Andy Serkis for granted for his motion capture. Yeah, definitely. Oh, they are. I think Andy Serkis deserves an Oscar, and I think because the the computer is doing so much work to change the actor's face, they're not realizing how much of that is Andy Serkis, that it's like, or it's all him. It's all him. Like, they don't yeah. realize that really the facial expressions, because you put the tracking dots everywhere, I mean, they can change and make some adjustments to that, but not a ton. I mean, you could you can make adjustments to superheroes with CG uh, to their performance. It's no different. And he, what he is bringing to a character is a fully formed thing, just like any other actor. And it's frustrating. To be honest, it's it's, and in many ways, it's more difficult than acting in a set with clothes that you're wearing that remind you who you are as a character with set pieces that show you, you know, that are the thing that you're touching. He has to engage more of his imagination than a character who is just a person in a suit. Yeah. So in a way, I think his job is harder. I don't want to discount anything that other actors are doing. I don't I don't want that. I would say it's different, but it certainly engages more of your imagination. There there's whole science behind it. When you, you when you hear Andy or other guys who played apes in War for the Planet Apes uh, trilogy yeah. and you're just amazed how they are putting such performance in such yeah. roles in that movie. And yeah, with the movement yeah. and everything. Yeah. Especially with the movie. Yeah. Uh, yep. And I was also amazed. I got to I work saw... with this guys. Actually, I got to work with some of the guys who were part of those those apes on that stage in Canada because of the you know, um, uh, Ukon in Gears of War Tactics. Uh, we used some of that talent. Oh, it's cool. Anyway, sorry. What were you saying? <laughs> well, I, I wanted to say also about uh, um, after Logan came out, you know, and there's a, a scene in the ending when Logan is running through the forest, and they, they published the video with Hugh Jackman just uh, 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 giving voiceover for that scene where he's in the studio and he's rampaging, yeah. screaming. Yeah, yeah. And it's a lasting impact on everybody who watched. And is yeah. it something similar in your studios when you are uh, <laughs> yes. doing voiceover? Yes, 100%. It, it's me. I look like Hugh Jackman on the treadmill. <laughs> you, know, where I, I, you know, if you're fighting, you are 100% fighting. 
because mm-hmm. if you're just kind of pretending you're you're it will pick it up that it's not as intense so when i'm when i'm behind the mic i mean for example when i played the joker in batman hush and we did the alley scene where the joker is getting choked by batman i'm actually have my hand around my throat you can ask the the voice directors who you know directed me wes gleason like i i was literally like i want you to break your gun you know like and and i'm He's throwing me around in the alley scene and I'm like throwing myself around so that the sounds that I'm making are, they're real. You mm-hmm. want them to sound so that the audience feels what you're going through. And you have, you put your body through those physicalities uh, to get the performance. Of course you do. Yeah. There are no rules, but one drink Jägermeister at minus 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, lastly, let me ask you, if you could voice any character, past or present, from any medium, who would it be and why? I want to voice Batman. Uh, I want to play Bruce Wayne in Batman. I think I I just really Six enjoy... Phil. Yes. And uh, I think I can manage. I, 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 I think I've got one, a good Batman in me. Um, <laughs> and I also would love to play Spider-Man. But I, you know, Yuri is one year older than I am, Yuri Lowenthal, and he played Spider-Man yeah. in the PS4 game, and I played Scorpion. And um, I just have auditioned to play Spider-Man multiple times, and I'm pretty sure that that ship has sailed, sadly, for me as an actor. <laughs> but, um, you know. Can we get I, uh, a glimpse of your, of your Spider-Man? And they, and they, hey, look, um, I know that it, this isn't really what you think it is. Um, I, so... I pictured him being the the most current incarnation of Spider-Man in the uh-huh. movies. Um, Tom, you know, plays him. And I, I've actually voice matched Tom twice uh, for different trailers for different movies and things like that. So, yeah, I think I could, I could manage since that's kind of what's in these days, you know. But that's just yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. And let me ask you this, uh, maybe. Uh, after 45 or 50 minutes, could you portray a gla- uh, uh, a voice of Montenegrin podcaster? <laughs> accent. <laughs> oh, I see. After 45 or 50 minutes, could you portray a voice of Montenegrin podcast? <laughs> it's close. Close. I could be close. Mm. Good yeah, sure. If we had 10 more minutes, you would, you would kill it. Yeah. <laughs> if I had 10 more minutes, I could kill it. Yes, I could. <laughs> <laughs> closer every time yeah okay so thank you for this enjoyable talk but before we wrap up we have a little tradition I ended up sounding like Victor from Arcade that was kind of weird actually yeah I know it, it was a little like bit when you, when you hear it yeah yeah a, li- a little bit yes he has that and it's so that I think in my brain as I started to do it out loud I started to hear Harry and I was like oh shoot <laughs> <laughs> and as I was saying, uh, we have a quote on Montenegrin language which we translate to English, and I uh, cho- chose a quote from a uh, uh, songwriter Desanka Maksimovic, and she said, Lijepasi, obučena, ali progovori da vidim kos. And on English it would be, you're beautiful, you're dressed nicely, but speak up so I can see who you are. <laughs> that basically means choose your wife wisely, but uh, <laughs> it also refers to uh, voice actors. <laughs> Yes, it does, actually. I think that's um, a very apropos quote to voice actors. Mm-hmm. Although we don't always dress nicely. You got me in a dress shirt. You're lucky. Because we don't have to dress nice when we go into the studio. Yeah. Luckily, we had the worst dress on this show. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah we are made up for belly button dog. Well, I came back with some ratty t-shirt on. Yeah. It yeah. was lovely to spend this time with you. Thank you as so well. much for having me as on well. your show, guys. Thank you for coming. How do you say goodbye then in Montenegrin? Do we say ili pozdra? Ili pozdra? Ili pozdra? Wait, say it again. <laughs> pozdra. 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 Oh, pozdra. 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 Okay. You're getting I, it. <laughs> terrible. I'm getting to it. Pozdra. pozdra. Yeah, I'll, I I'll email you a few words to exercise. <laughs> yes, I'll have to do my best. I want to play a Montenegrin now. <laughs> so that I don't sound Russian. 
We stay genuine, uncensored and unscripted, and we always will, as we have to order our usual. Share us, subscribe us, and stay tuned until the next Wednesday. Iguzo!